This is the beginning of the construction of the first guest house at Mayapur. That was what, what you call the Lotus Building. It was designed in Calcutta by a, an architect named Mr. Gujarati who lived on the other side of the Pukor from Albert Road. He designed that nice building and showed it to Prabhupada and he said, yes, this is a nice building. He said, build it. And this man, Mr. Gujarati, he had uh, lines in his forehead. And Prabhupada said, oh, he said, you have natural tilak. It's a very good sign. And we were still living up front in the uh, straw house. We lived up in that straw house for a long time. Even when the deities were in this temple on the ground floor, that would be summer because that's Kal Baishak season with those big cyclones. It would be so hot and then these huge black clouds would come up and then it would just be this heavy downpour and then you'd have some, you know, freshness for a few days. When Prabhupada came to Amsterdam, that was the time I met him the first time. And so Prabhupada just came out of immigration and he saw me and he waved. And it was very ecstatic. I fell to the ground, paid my obeisances, and I laughed and I cried and I had uh, so many emotions at the same time, which was extraordinary. Uh, normally you either laugh or you either cry, or if, uh, but you don't have these emotions at the same time. Then he came to the temple and he gave a lecture. And the amazing thing of the lecture was, prior to that, I could not understand Prabhupada's broad Indian dialect at all, particularly since English is not my first language. But the amazing thing was that as soon as he started talking, I could understand every single word, which was quite remarkable. I couldn't believe it, I went later, put on a tape, and I listened to it, and the head was, I understood every single word. It was kind of a miracle. It was 1971, and there was so many hippies at the time, and everything was a lot more liberal and free. This is Vondrel Park. It's a very big park in Amsterdam. A hundred of people turn up, actually. So Prabhupada did not give a class as such. He spoke very little, and he said that we should have kirtan and give them prasadam. That will be the best help that they can have at this point. Betanian Shrat, which was the first place where we had a temple in Amsterdam, it was a garage in the street. Right behind was the red light district. And um, so Rabi transformed that garage into a temple room and he actually built the altar. And the interesting thing about Amsterdam, because there were so many hippies, Mongol Arctic was always packed because they didn't sleep all night. They used to hear the kirtan reverberated around all the canals and the streets. And they all used to come and dance and sing with us. I mean, dozens of them every day. And after that, they used to say for Peshadam. So Amsterdam provided Peshadam for literally thousands and thousands of people coming because they were so attracted with the only temple in Amsterdam in those days. <laughs> It was held in the late summer, of course, in August, and many non-devotees came, many young people, students. So just the scope of it, the dimension, and uh, the number of devotees, number of non-devotees, it, it was sort of like a, a landmark event. Everyone that was there felt it to be so, and even Prabhupada, that, that something new and greater was occurring. Srila Prabhupada was to come to New Vrindavan to conduct what he entitled the Bhagavad Dharma Discourses. He was going to speak from Srimad Bhagavatam for seven days. The devotees at New Vrindavan, under the guidance of Kirtanananda Maharaj, were very, very enthusiastic to prepare the community for his arrival. They worked hard cutting down trees to construct a big pandal on the top of a mountain the highest mountain of the area. That was to be the place where Srila Prabhupada would speak. Also, the devotees painted and renovated the house that Prabhupada was going to stay in. 
did so much landscaping, and especially they were working on building a brand new temple for Sri Sri Radha Vrindavan Chandra, which was to be inaugurated on the night of Janmashtami by Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada drove in a black Lincoln Continental into the new Vrindavan property. It was ecstatic kirtan as devotees welcomed him. One thing that really made an impression on me at that festival was the loving concern by the sannyasis and senior disciples of Srila Prabhupada for all of us, preaching to us lovingly. We all sat together and ate prasadam. You could walk up to anyone and ask a question, and they would take the time to answer you and give you association. The feeling that we were a family, and there was Srila Prabhupada. He was our father. We all felt sheltered. We all felt protected. It was like a resurgence of energy and rededication. We all went back to our temples completely refreshed and rejuvenated and ready for whatever austerities we had to perform. Devotees with very, very deep enthusiasm, stood and sat all around him very closely as he spoke his welcoming address, thanking the devotees for their hard work, their efforts, and giving a basic message of Krishna consciousness. Srila Prabhupada, through his words and through his smile, while sitting there on that Vyasasan, under a tree at Bahulaban, satisfied everyone's hearts. All of the hard work and intensive labor that was offered by the devotees over the previous several months was completely uh, fulfilled. It all bore fruit when Srila Prabhupada smiled upon us and expressed his satisfaction to be with us at New Vrindavan again cooking for the deities, and doing the artiques. That was my service. So one time Srila Prabhupada was there when I did the artique. I had a wonderful realization. I turned around. I was dirty because I'd been cooking all day, and then they pushed me onto the altar. And I was totally embarrassed. But I turned around to offer incense to Srila Prabhupada, and I realized that he was always there on the Vyasa sign, that it was absolutely no different. And I still feel like that, that he's present, even though it would be nice to be able to see him more clearly. And so he was staying in the small house at Madhavan, and I was standing outside, and he came out. And I suspect he came out to pass urine, which I realized years later, but I didn't know it at the time, and I was just standing there. And he came out, and I didn't pay obeisances. I couldn't say anything. I just stood there like a deer in the headlights of a car and was totally terrified. But it was a wonderful thing, because he smiled. You know, he was so gracious. He smiled and made me feel so at ease and not like I had done something stupid or that I was, you know, somehow lacking. <laughs> he was so kind. He just stood there with me for a while and then he smiled and turned around and went back in the building. I mean, he's always been kind to me like that because I'm very shy and, you know, I don't, I don't ever put myself forward. So he would, he would put himself out for me. I had experiences like that with him where he would, he would reassure me. That's what I felt like. Devotees from New York and various other centers brought van loads of boga for the festival. And there was a kitchen set up right on the top of the mountain in the most primitive conditions with oil barrels. They made stoves. And many dozens and dozens of devotees volunteered cutting vegetables, cooking with smoke bellowing up into people's eyes. But it was such a beautiful sight, just seeing devotees from all over America working together in these very primitive forests of New Vrindavan, preparing prasad for Srila Prabhupada's Vyas Puja feast. And one time Prabhupada was sitting taking a massage, and then right in front of Prabhupada, these two little kittens were wrestling, and, and they actually rolled right onto Prabhupada's lap. 
And so among the various zealous misconceptions that plagued us in our early days, one that we had is that you know animals were so contaminated that it's horrible to even touch them. I was sort of appalled that these two kittens, just they were cute, but they just rolled right onto Prabhupada's lap. And I was thinking, oh my God, an animal touched Prabhupada. But to my surprise, Prabhupada just started petting them. And Prabhupada said two things. He said, he said, look, even here there is love. And what I immediately understood from that was that our original love for Krishna is so strong that even in the body of an animal or a cat, it still manifests in some way. And then Prabhupada said, if I put my head in your lap and you cut my throat, that is the greatest sin. He said the greatest sin is that if someone trusts you and takes shelter of you, and then you betray them and cause them harm. It can be parents toward a child, it can be a man protecting a woman. Any situation where someone has sincerely trusted us and depends on us, and then we betray them. This was such a unique altar arrangement here, because um, they had Radha Damodar in the center, Jaganath Jagannath on the side, and Prabhupada on the left. You know, used to having the picture of Prabhupada on the left. We had Prabhupada in person on the left, next to the deities. I'd never seen that before, that you had an altar where Prabhupada was sitting next to the deities in person. So that was real special. And then I remember after the Vyasa Puja ceremony, it was time for the feast. They didn't close the curtains on the altar. I don't remember ever taking feast where they didn't close the curtains on the altar. So this whole sequence of events, and then just looking around at that whole hillside, it was a panoramic scene of you know buses and vans and tents and just devotees and cows all over the meadows. And I just, it was just like a, a, a chapter of Krishna book, come to life. Now, I think it was the same day, and I was down at the barn, and I was, you know, watching the Volkswagen go up the hillside, and um, the cows were all over that, that hillside, and they were decorated, just like it's described in Krishna book, with, you know, patterns made from different minerals, all different colors and different patterns. And when Prabhupada looked out of the Volkswagen, he smiled like, you know, I've never seen him smile except in that picture when in the Lilamrita when Bridge stood up for the first time. He's just beaming as Sally Agarwal described it, that oceanic smile. When Prabhupada looked out at the cows decorated like that and he smiled like that. That little episode, it's just like one you know, remembrance of how sweet the whole occasion was. And a devotee asked Prabhupada, what does it mean to have love for the spiritual master? What does love of the guru mean? And so I was thinking, Prabhupada would say, you have all these feelings in your heart and you, you know, feel this and you feel that. And that's what I was expecting to hear. And Prabhupada said, love for the guru means you have taken initiation. You have made vow to the spiritual master and taken fire sacrifice. You keep your vow. That is love. And when I heard that, I said, you know, again, that was one of those statements that Prabhupada would make where all the devotees we were just taken uh, completely by surprise, you know, at Prabhupada's definition of love. It was not a feeling at all, but keeping our vow that we made to him when we got initiated. And that is how we show whether we really have love or not. The next day was Vyas Puja, and Srila Prabhupada, being very sensitive to the time, place, and circumstance, gave this wonderful Vyas Puja address to describe the spiritual master and why the spiritual master was being offered so much honor and homage on this day, because after all, there were many people there, scholars and journalists, etc., who were not uh, familiar with this etiquette. So, Srila Prabhupada said, uh, Krishna is very big. He's a very big, big person. 
And Prabhupada said, just like in this material world, if you want to please or even see a big man, it is very difficult to do. He often used Ford and Rockefeller. So he said, just like Mr. Ford, if you want to please Mr. Ford, it's very hard, or even to see him, it's very hard. But if you happen to see Mr. Ford walking his dog, and you give Mr. Ford's dog a two-cent lozenge, Prabhupada used the word lozenge, then Mr. Ford is very easily pleased. So Prabhupada said, I'm the dog of God. It is very difficult to approach Krishna, but if you simply please his dog, Krishna will be pleased. And the day of Prabhupada's arrival, uh, they needed volunteers to uh, fix up the house where Prabhupada was staying, and I went up to help. There was, of course, a frenzy of activity, just as there always is, just before Prabhupada comes in any temple. And it was just uh, an amazing sight to behold. And finally Prabhupada arrives, and all of the sannyasis come with him, and uh, there's about eight or ten sannyasis, and they all file into the house. There's a few devotees um, hovering by the door, and uh, Prabhupada sees us over there by the door, and everybody else is inside the house, the, the big guns in the movement, so to speak, and Prabhupada motions that we should also come inside. And so the devotees are outside the door, they're sitting just on the front row, right in front of Prabhupada. And Prabhupada's talking uh, about um, developing New Vrindavan. One thing I remember he said that, is that New Vrindavan is non-different than Vrindavan in India. And that uh, he also mentioned that, that uh, Tulsi is the uh, spiritual barometer for a temple. And then just out of nowhere, he uh, looks right at me and he asks, are you trying to understand the philosophy? So I was so dumbfounded that the Prabhupada was talking to me, I, I couldn't even say a word. I was just uh, totally in a state of shock. But what I did appreciate is the way Prabhupada phrased that question, are you trying to understand the philosophy? That if someone just makes an endeavor to understand, that's uh, sufficient. Prabhupada would be pleased just by somebody making an, an endeavor to try to understand. Whether they understand or not, that's another matter, but just to try to understand the philosophy. Bardaraj was leading, and after the kirtan started getting a little more lively, Vishnu John Maharaj took over the lead. Vishnu John kept uh, kind of lovingly singing the, the Maha Mantra. Uh, all the devotees were starting to rock side to side. And then Srila Prabhupada, uh, he closed his eyes and he was starting to hit the cartels together with more and more force. At one point, which seemed to be the perfect crescendo of the chanting of Vishnu John, everyone was, was shocked when Srila Prabhupada uh, interrupted Vishnu John uh, and took over the kirtan. That had not been seen before. Prabhupada seemed to be in such an ecstatic mood that he had no choice uh, but to take over the kirtan. And at that moment, everyone went absolutely mad. There was a rush toward the stage, and I was right in front of Prabhupada, and we were kind of crushed into the stage, and everyone's arms, it looked like a thousand arms were outstretched to Srila Prabhupada. People started to cry. Uh, Srila Prabhupada's chanting was so beautiful. It's, it's almost like the, the sky opened up, love of God came down, and it poured over all of us. Because at one point, people could, they were crying so much that they just started to whimper and, um, and gasp. Uh, I've never been to a kirtan like that before in my life, never since. And I think I cried for about an hour after that. The day wore on and we were fasting and chanting. And then nighttime fell and, you know, the midnight RT. And after fasting and chanting, everybody's ready to break fast. 
But Srila Prabhupada has uh, the devotees open up Krishna book because now he wants to hear about Krishna. It's the appearance of Lord Krishna. So Prabhupada sits up straight and his eyes are open and he's all ready to hear and we're all ready to eat, basically. <laughs> so Krishna's pastimes are being read. Now it's 12.30, quarter to one, one o'clock. And everyone in the room except for Prabhupada is gradually being overcome by the forces of sleep. And we finished the first chapter, and then it continued into the second chapter and the prayers by the demigods for Lord Krishna and the womb, fairly weighty philosophical topics. And you would see these dundas nodding like divining rods, or like crossed swords crossing in the aisle, as the sannyasis bearing them would gradually be falling asleep, and then the rods would again, split apart from one another as the sannyasis would jerk themselves awake and then the rods would gradually descend again as the devotees holding them descended towards sleep. But Prabhupada was very staunch. He was there listening very intently. And at one point I remember looking around the room and everyone in the room was asleep except for Prabhupada. At one point it was really incredible. I was watching Prabhupada very carefully to see if he was going to fall asleep. And at one point, Prabhupada looked like he was starting to nod. And he just leaned forward ever so slightly and immediately caught himself and sat back up straight. And with his right hand, he made a chopping motion like, no, I won't fall asleep. And from that moment on, he was sitting there listening in rapt attention. Then suddenly, it's pitch black. The power had gone out. So I was thinking, what is Srila Prabhupada's expression going to be when the lights come back on? Is he going to be upset? Is he, what is he thinking about? It seemed like a very long time that the power was off. And when the lights came back on, Prabhupada had this huge ear-to-ear -ear grin on his face. And the words that he said were, so now... Krishna is sitting on the lap of Mother Yasoda. I think you are all tired, so we can stop here. And all the devotees started roaring. I remember um, Gayatri and several other of Iskand's best bakers spending several days to cook a gigantic cake for Srila Prabhupada's Vyas Puja. It was the most enormous cake I ever saw in my entire life. And they were cooking everything on this very, very simple makeshift wood oven. The fuel was wood, and they made the oven out of some sort of um, big cans, barrels. And they would just make a little piece at a time, a little piece at a time, and they just, as the days went on, they were stacking it up, and they, it ended up a huge, glorious, incredible cake. They brought it all the way up on the hill. Many devotees had to carry it. And then they offered to Srila Prabhupada. And as Srila Prabhupada was eating it, it became prasad. So within moments, devotees gathered around the cake for remnants, and they practically dove into that cake. Within a matter of seconds, this gigantic cake disappeared. This was a really glorious return for him to Vrindavan. He just really enjoyed his disciples being there. And Prabhupada was really excited about going back there. I became his servant like a month before. And he, you know, he had it planned out and he would give little ideas of what his plan was. And that's what he said, he would be speaking in English because it was for his disciples, he said, not that he was going to speak in Hindi to, to the local inhabitants or Braj, but he wanted to speak to his disciples. You know, he was training them up in Krishna consciousness. We lived in Keshigat by the banks of the Jamuna, 
and every morning we would attend Mangal Arti in Keshigat. And after that, a Chutananda Swami would take a Sankirtan party and would go all the way to Raman Reti, where the Krishna Balaram temple was under construction. And then we'd walk back along the Parikrama path that followed the Jamuna River and go to the Radhadamadar temple in time to meet Srila Prabhupada there. And Prabhupada would lead us in the Jai Radha Madhava prayers. And then he would speak on Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, chapter two, divinity and divine service. And although we had heard what he was saying before, it was the basic Krishna conscious philosophy. In that atmosphere, it had tremendous impact. I can't imagine how fortunate we were, that small group of us, to be in the most auspicious place, Vrindavan, and then within Vrindavan, in such an auspicious place where the Goswamis used to sit together, and to be there at such an auspicious time, Kartik, with Krishna's pure representative, Srila Prabhupada. It was simply Srila Prabhupada's kindness upon us that he made this arrangement to impress upon us this incredible philosophy of Krishna consciousness, so powerful, so important, so profound. So it was an incredible month, and a month that I will remember my entire life. Certainly it moved me very deeply. But once we were walking in Vrindavan along the road, and um, it was just a couple of us, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, Prabhupada just stops. And he turned around, and he looked at me straight in the face. And he said, uh, So, Dinanath, you will become a pure devotee? Simultaneously, it was a question, but it was a directive, too. He was inquiring, but at the same time, he was giving me a directive. And I immediately answered, I said, Yes, Srila Prabhupada. Then, about a day later, we're walking again the same way. He stops again, turns and looks at me, and he says to me, don't change anything. Turns back around and keeps walking. Prophet's room at the Radha Damodar Temple, you can see behind there's like these little, uh, little holes. It, it, it lets the, the wind come through. And you can actually see behind in the courtyard. So Shamazunder's daughter, Saraswati, was there and she was pulling on the shirt of a little Bengali gentleman. And she was telling the gentleman, who is Krishna? Do you know who is Krishna? And the gentleman looked at this amused look on his face. Saraswati may have been four or five years old at the time. She was very young. And Prabhupada was looking, and we were looking. And the man was, was amused that this little girl would ask him that. And then she told him, Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead, and you should surrender to him. And Prabhupada says, just see, she's a guru. She's preaching about Krishna. We were all sick with fever and dysentery, and because the conditions were very austere. And uh, I remember Vishaka <laughs> and I, we used to prefer to just jump in the Jamuna River, even though it was completely pitch dark and we couldn't see anything, we couldn't touch the bottom, rather than go in the bathroom, which was slimy and uh, indescribable. So then Prabhupada would give lectures in the morning on Bhagavatam and in the evening on Nectar of Devotion. At that time, the courtyard was just dust and there was a lot of... I remember rubble around it, and to me the temple looked like it was bombed out. It, we couldn't even tell it was a temple, it was the front of it. It was all like crumbling, and the inside there was rubble everywhere in the courtyard, and it was dust. But it, actually I prefer the dust because it was the original dust where the six Goswamis sat. And Prabhupada did mention in his lecture how the six Goswamis used to sit in, the, in that very courtyard discussing Bhagavatam. And Jiva Goswami would be sitting and writing his commentaries, and another one would be singing the verses. So we were sitting in that same place hearing Prabhupada discuss Bhagavatam. And then after the evening, nectar devotion, Prabhupada would have um, 
darshan in his room. And that time, he would just talk very informally. I remember him warning us not to associate with the Babajis. And he talked about Markad Vairagya, that the monkey has many wives. He's vegetarian, and he's renounced it, but he has many wives. So the Babajis are like that. He told us he said we shouldn't associate with them. This pandal was uh, organized for Srila Prabhupada. Uh, this place was uh, exhibition grounds in the center of the Hyderabad city. And for about 10 days, Prabhupada gave lectures morning and evening. These deities are Radha Madhava. That must be in the morning, starting by Kirtan. So there were quite a good number of devotees, maybe uh, at least 50. It was very successful. That was the most successful uh, program of Srila Prabhupada in Hyderabad. Every day, about not less than 5,000, sometimes 10,000 used to come, especially in the evenings. And morning, one or 2,000. It was the beginning of our mission in Hyderabad. All the most important people attended as chief guests, and there was a committee also a form of uh, some of the most important businessmen. So they were very uh, impressed by this program. One gentleman, Mr. G. Pullareddy, was uh, having a sweet shop in Hyderabad. He came forward to donate a piece of land measuring about uh, 950 square yards in the center of the city. And uh, now our East Con Hyderabad is situated there. At that time in Hyderabad, there had not been any rain for at least one year. In the last monsoon, there was no rain. But during uh, our program there, in the last uh, two, three days, the rain started. And uh, Prabhupada mentioned this is due to our kirtan. It also came in newspapers that the San Kirtan is uh, bringing rain. So I was greeting the deities and offering to the deities, and Prabhupada came up and paid his obeisances to the deities and then walked back. Uh, to give his morning class. Well, I'd always been trained that you never leave the deities alone. So even though I wanted to go listen to Prabhupada, I felt as a Pajari, it was my duty to stay there. So I was staying there, and about 30 seconds later, Bhavananda comes running back down to where I was and said, oh, you are here? Good. Prabhupada wanted to make sure someone was with the deities. So that really struck me that here, you know, everybody's chanting Jai Prabhupada, Jai Prabhupada, and he's going up, getting flower garlands, getting to, you know, getting worshipped. But he's thinking, oh, is somebody with Radha and Krishna? And that was really nice, you know, both to see that Prabhupada had, you know, was thinking like that and then to feel that I had, you know, understood Prabhupada in that way. So one morning, Prabhupada gave a lecture, and after the lecture, one Indian gentleman came up to Prabhupada, he had just purchased a small book. One of these small Krishna consciousness topmost yoga system was out. And he asked Prabhupada to autograph it. So I was standing right next to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada smiled and said yes. So the gentleman handed him a pen, and Prabhupada autographed the book. So then uh, another gentleman, seeing the opportunity, took a book and asked Prabhupada to autograph it, and Prabhupada autographed it. So I was standing right next to Prabhupada. So another man, the third man, he pulls out of his pocket a little uh, notepad and with a pen, and he says, asked Prabhupada for his autograph. Prabhupada looked at him and smiled and said, no book, no autograph. <laughs> we were in uh, Hyderabad. Um, at this time, I was torn between, you know, making my commitment to um, maintaining brahmachari and considering even going into sannyas and thinking about uh, marriage. I knew in my heart that I wasn't, you know, at the time wasn't right and I was young. But my spirit wanted it, you know. It wanted to um, live a renounced life. But my body and my mind wasn't ready, mature enough for it. So it was tearing my being in different directions. So I couldn't sleep one night. 
So I got up and I walked down this building we were staying in and I walked down the hallway and um, I kind of like peeked my head in Prabhupada's room and it's about 11 o'clock at night. And I peeked my head in and um, I saw Prabhupada walking, pacing back and forth up and down. So I kind of like wormed in or something, you know, slimed in and uh, offered my obeisances. And he was walking and he looked over at me and waved to me, get up, come, you know. So as he's walking, he brings me over to him and we're walking side by side, back and forth, you know, Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, you know. So he goes, yes. So I says, um, I said, Prabhupada, you know, um, I'm thinking about going to the Harishikesh. He just became silent. He's listening. And he gave me a chance to explain. He didn't ask anything, you know. I said, I'm thinking about going to Harishikesh and maybe to live as a brahmachari, you know, to go and live in an ashram. I have to be around any women and things and I can dedicate myself to um, brahmachari life. So after explaining my heart and everything, him, you know, he stopped. And it was like time stood still and the earth stopped, you know, and everything. And he just looked at me dead in the face and the eyes. And he said, um, he said, please don't do that. I wasted 12 years simply sitting in Brindavan. He said, just tell everybody you meet about Krishna. At that point, I felt my problem was solved. I didn't know what, you know, what I was going to do personally, but my problem was solved, and I bowed down. I said, thank you, Prabhupada. He started walking again. I went to rest. Palika and Jamuna and Malati in the kitchen, they were preparing prasadam for Srila Prabhupada, and I was in the front room and then Srila Prabhupada was in a, another interior room on the ground floor uh, behind his desk. And his servant brought in a sadhu from South India. And he sat down in Srila Prabhupada's room, but I didn't hear any conversation going on between them. Uh, it was like, <clears throat> why aren't they speaking to each other? And then all of a sudden I heard a huge argu verbal argument you know, and they were screaming at each other at the top of their lungs in Hindi. And all of a sudden, you know, I was really concerned. Well, what's going on? And uh, then all of a sudden, this guy storms out of the house. And for the next two weeks, Srila Prabhupada was so grave. And the lectures, if you listen to those lectures, he's talking about Chatur Varanam Mayasristam Guna Karma Vibhagasha. Krishna has established a natural system of. Uh, varna, an ashram, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra. It is something that happens within society naturally, and people are judged to be in one of these uh, categories, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra, by their qualities and by the work that they do. Never in this verse does Krishna mention anything about birth. So we found out later on that what this argument was about was this guy was coming in and saying, you can't do this. You can't take malechas and yavanas from the West, uh, meat eaters, and convert them into Brahmins, give them the sacred thread, give them the sannyas tridandi. And of course, this argument had been presented in different ways uh, to his acharya, his guru Maharaj, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. So this was a fight that was going on for a long time. And Srila Prabhupada, in the next two weeks, quoted all the different verses from all the different shastras, uh, explaining that Krishna consciousness is a universal movement. It is not just for India. It includes the entire world. They wanted devotees to come down from Calcutta and Mayapur for a pandal, you know, because they had no devotees there. So I took Radha Madhava from here, and that other Lord Chaitana, Tarankanti Ghosh, had made for us. And we went down and set up the pandal there. Prabhupada was looking at the deities, and uh, he turned to me and he said, is that Radha Madhava? I said, oh yes, Prabhupada, we brought them from Mayapur. Anyway, he said, you should not take from Mayapur. He said, but what's done is done when you take them back. They're to stay there forever.
This day, I was working in the kitchen under the supervisor of Panchiti with her Sami, uh, cleaning and all the details. And it's already after nine in the morning and nobody came for Prashad. So I asked uh, Maharaj, why nobody is coming for Prashad? He said, in the temple there's a fire sacrifice. And I said, what is fire sacrifice? He said, Prabhupada giving initiation. After that, they will come. I said, what is initiation? So I was insist to come and see what is a fire sacrifice and the initiation. I don't know anything about that. Maybe that was three or four weeks I was there. So he said, OK, you can go for 10 minutes. There's a lot of work to do in the, in the kitchen. So I came, and I stood in that side of the corner, watching what is going on. Then Prabhupada saw me. He said, you come and sit down for initiation. Then Prabhupada asked me many questions during that initiation. First, he gave me the beads. Then he said, uh, what is your name? I said, my name is Sekhar Kumar, but Girira Sami and everybody call me Haridas. He said, OK, keep that name, but you must follow the teaching of Haridas. Then he asked me, do you follow four principles? Because I don't understand, I said, no. Then Girira Sami said, Haridas, those not eating meat, not fish, not uh, drinking. I said, yeah, yeah, those I know, those I follow. Then gave me the beats, and then he sent me back. He said, now you go to the kitchen and start working. The fire sacrifice is still not over. And when he gone back to the kitchen to work, and Panchadevita Maharaj got angry at me. He said, what took long time, you know? He was sending you for 10 minutes. I said, I just got the initiation. He said, what are you are doing? Go back there. So I came back again, and that was like a climax of the fire sacrifice. In 1972, in December, Srila Prabhupada went to the house of one uh, Vaishnav gentleman named Kartikeya Mahadevya. And this particular gentleman had some very nice apartment, luxurious apartment, fronting the ocean. So Srila Prabhupada went to his place and stayed there. It's pretty spacious quarters. Quite a few devotees every night would come there. So we went to see Srila Prabhupada. We had come back from it, a trip to South India. We had gone to Madurai, Coimbatore, Bangalore, several places. And Prabhupada says, someday I want to go there and see. So you, Prabhupada said, you please make arrangements to take me there someday. I says, well, okay, Prabhupada. And then we told Prabhupada, well, Prabhupada, we've been to some place in Coimbatore, and we worked really hard, and we were going to so many places, and we were trying to make life members, but we could hardly make any life members. And we went to some other place, and we hardly did anything. We just sat in the room and chanted. We ended up making like 20 life members. So, so we don't understand this. And Prabhupada said, well, you don't understand because you're too attached to the result. And then Prabhupada quoted that verse from Bhagavad Gita, karmani evadikara ste mafalesu kadachana, that, you know, you do your duty, but don't be attached to the result. And Prabhupada says, you leave the result to Krishna. And Prabhupada said, you leave the result to Krishna, act sincerely. And Prabhupada says, if you're very sincere, Krishna himself personally will see that you become successful. And Prabhupada says, but you have to understand, this is not simply about an amount of money. He says, you do the service and Krishna will judge. Krishna will decide. And then Prabhupada says, my Guru Maharaj one time told me that even if there's not so many people, we can preach to the wall. That doesn't matter, we can preach to the wall. Prabhupada says, you just go on preaching, that's all. You just be sincere, preach, and Krishna will make it successful. The last day of the Pandal was a Sunday, and more people attended than ever before. There's tens of thousands of people in the huge Pandal. Prabhupada lectured very strongly from the vyasa -san, And then when he finished, the kirtan began, as it did every evening. And this kirtan was especially enthusiastic. And then at one point, he got up off the Vyasa Sun and went before the deities, clapping. And then he started to circumambulate the deities with a very light step. He went around once, and then he went around a second time, and then a third time. And when he came before the deities, very gracefully, he put his arms in the air and he began to dance. It was almost as if he was weightless. He danced so effortlessly. And Everyone was electrified by this. Everyone in the audience was riveted on Srila Prabhupada dancing before the deities. At that point, I was in the audience. I was photographing the Pandal program. And it felt as if 
all the sinful reactions of all those people suddenly lifted. It was an extraordinary feeling. There was such a lightness there. It's stated in the Nectar Devotion that if you clap your hands in kirtan, then the sinful reactions leave you, just like birds leaving a tree when there's a sudden noise. They all fly off together. And that's what it felt like. There's this burden of karma lifting all at one time. In spite of all the stories of Prabhupada, I, who had been an English major in college and read a lot of fiction, had always had an idea of there being a dichotomy between the author and his works. So I just always had this keenness to meet Prabhupada, the author of this book, the Bhagavad Gita and other words that were coming out. And when Prabhupada came to Australia, what struck me was that whether Prabhupada was speaking before an audience of six, seven hundred people or whether he was just in a room alone with me, he was basically speaking the Bhagavatam and the Gita. He was the Gita and the Bhagavatam. You know, you might think that someone would have a public persona, but then when they get back home, you know, there might be other topics of conversation. But he would preach just as strongly to me as the only other person in the room as he would in a huge rented hall with a, with a large crowd. That inspired me to launch a very, very deep study of Srila Prabhupada's books. And I think because I did that and continue to do it to this day, I've never, I've never faltered in my faith in Krishna consciousness. We are selling about 25 to 30,000 of these books daily. Actually, I didn't know about this movement until Mr. Dadlani came to my office. He was our neighbor, and he came asking whether I could uh, make arrangement for uh, the Swamiji's stay in Jakarta. So I immediately told him, OK. At that time, there were not many hotels, so I offered to give our own building. We started to make preparation. We moved to another house and gave the whole building to, to Swamiji. Jaya's Jina trading. So this was our house, actually. We had a shop down, office, and uh, we were living upstairs on the second and third floor. And uh, Swamiji's room was my room, my bedroom. So I was very happy that he could stay in my bedroom and bless it. This is at the, the VIP part of the airport in Jakarta. So we had this special area booked for a greeting of Srila Prabhupada. And there are representatives of the Hindu Indian community and the Hindu Bali, means the Balinese Hindu community, but living in Jakarta. They call themselves Hindu Bali. So you have a selection of representatives greeting Srila Prabhupada and uh, presenting talks. The Vyasa son, we, uh, we got a, a frame welded together which could be unbolted. And when it comes apart, you can stack it on top of a car or a vehicle. So this Vyasa sign appears here and also at Thakur Das Watwani's house and at the National Administration Building Lecture because we, we were disassembling it and moving it everywhere. When I was in the high school, this was about a year before Srila Prabhupada came to Jakarta. Uh, the devotees came to the school auditorium and they did a massive kirtan whereby I was impressed and more curious to find out about them because it was the first time I was seeing uh, Americans doing something like Hindu kirtan and although I already had some little background about my own religion from my parents but this was something different. And uh, after they did kirtan, I tried to find out where they were staying, who they were. In fact, I found out that they were staying not far away from the school where I was going. It was Gandhi School, and uh, I went to visit them. And ever since, I always attended their morning 
uh, kirtans plus uh, the lectures and I even went in the evening time. We had a small children's club that they started and I was chosen as the president. So our activities were like uh, make dramas from the Krishna book. Uh, I was as to be vegetarian, I was not vegetarian. So Amogadas said, you cannot help us in cooking until and unless you yourself become vegetarian. I asked them how long, I mean, it would take me to become vegetarian first and then help you. So he said, at least a month, you have to prove to us that you will have no tea, no coffee, no onions, uh, no meat eating. And uh, I actually started doing that, and soon after that I started chanting. I remember I brought my car and drove him in my car. And uh, that car I kept with me for a long, long time. I didn't want to sell it till it really broke down. <laughs> so I thought uh, since he had uh, sat in the car, so I didn't want to sell it. But finally, the car was getting old and giving a lot of trouble. I had to sell it away. That made my mother very, very angry because uh, she was seeing that I was becoming more and more Krishna conscious. And she was finding it difficult to cook separately for me. So she even uh, tried to make it hard for me, like, uh, you have to eat what I prepare or not at all. So. When I was really hungry, I had to go in the kitchen and cook myself. Uh, after I did that, my mother, I guess, felt pity about it, and uh, she started cooking, actually, for me. After a while, only Amogada stayed, and it was then that he saw my, perhaps, this is what he said, that I see some sincerity in you, and you want to see Srila Prabhupada. And I said, I do, but... It sounds so impossible. Can we ask Srila Prabhupada to come here all the way, you know? And then he said, uh, yes, why not? Because uh, Srila Prabhupada always makes trips around the world and uh, soon he might come to Malaysia and he will go to Australia and looking at the uh, position of Indonesia, it's somewhere in between and we could ask him to stop by for a few days. Uh, so I said, uh, how would I do that? And he said, uh, well, just write sincerely to him. I will help you out and I will send it to him. Uh, Srila Prabhupada always answers all the letters that come to him. I actually made a letter, but uh, it was modified by Mogadas on how to put the words like, please accept my humble obeisances in the beginning. I, I did not know anything about that. And soon after that, uh, the letter was sent. Uh, in hardly, I think, 10 days to 15 days, I got a reply from Srila Prabhupada. It was a full page that he wrote. Uh, it was a very long letter. Like, uh, my blessings are for you, and uh, if you have sincerely invited me, if Krishna decides, I could uh, stop by for a few days. He did ask in his letter uh, about how many devotees are there. Do you chant regularly? Do you have programs regularly? What are your activities? He did ask about, uh, I hope you're keeping well. And uh, I would like to come and preach to the people there. He did not stress so much on the Indians, but at that time there were more Indian devotees than the local ones. So this is at the house of Thakur Das Watwani. He uh, had some pictures of Krishna posters that he bought from us in the hallway. And in this room where all the assembly is sitting, there's these big, huge paintings, one of Sai Baba, maybe Shiva, but none of Krishna. Srila Prabhupada gave the lecture in Hindi. And the questions and answers session, one man got up who was from Arya Samaj, and Arya Samaj are very atheistic, they deny the Bhagavad Gita, they deny so many things, that Krishna has a form, that God has a form. So this man actually argued with Prabhupada, kept arguing, and then Prabhupada, he called him something. And I remember the whole audience was shocked, but we couldn't really understand because we're in Hindi. As we know, devotees don't tolerate people who blaspheme Krishna in that way. 
after the meeting, they wanted to invite Prabhupada into the next room to eat. I uh, said to Srila Prabhupada, they'd like you to come into the next room for some prasadam. And Prabhupada said, we can go now? And I said, oh, yes, Srila Prabhupada, we could go now. But actually, they'd like you to go into the next room and, and have some prasadam. And he said, we can go now? So I knew he wanted to go. So I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada, we can go. So we went out to the car and left. And uh, they got very upset. But then the other thing is, uh, which is seen in other times of history, that the disciple can take some blame instead of someone blaming the guru. So um, everyone blamed me for escorting Prabhupada out of the situation there and said it was all my fault. And Prabhupada didn't leave, but I misdirected or misorganized. So in that way, I guess it's good because they, instead of criticizing a pure devotee, they just criticized myself. This is my sister and me. We were at the exhibition for the book sale. My mother changed a lot after seeing Srila Prabhupada. In fact, she told me that when she had a personal conversation with Srila Prabhupada, she had requested within her heart from Krishna to show whether this Swamiji who is sitting in front of me is actually a true Swami and uh, an honest man. And she saw some light coming from Srila Prabhupada's eyes, some glitter, uh, where she was very, very satisfied. And she told me about this incident after coming out from the conversation with Srila Prabhupada. Uh, in fact, after that, I also joined the conversation with her and with Srila Prabhupada. And it was a very, very personal conversation where he had sat back comfortably and uh, discussed about the old India times uh, and they were exchanging their own experiences. When seeing that, in fact, I was like looking at a sister and a brother talking to each other. And he told me about how during his young days he used to see his parents uh, cook rice in the hot sand. And I said, Srila Prabhupada, it's impossible to cook rice in hot sand without fire. And he had laughed and he said, yes, what do you know, you know, because you're born in the modern age. Why don't you believe me, he said. And I had to laugh and I said, of course, Srila Prabhupada, if you say so and if you've seen it, then it must be true. Then suddenly he asked us, uh, so are there papadams here? Uh, what food do you eat? And we told him, both of us, that we cook Indian food. We get all kinds of vegetables here. It's almost like India, my mother told him. And he asked about papadams again. And then I said, uh, oh, Srila Prabhupada, we get giant papadams. And he began to converse in Hindi with my mother. And he said, is she saying the truth? There are giant papadams? What do you mean by giant papadams? And then my mother told him they are double the size of Indian papadams. And then he said, who makes them? And I had to explain to him, Srila Prabhupada, uh, we have cooks. Uh, in most of the Indian homes, we have local cooks whom we train up. Oh, so you train the cooks and they sell back to you the papadams? And I had to laugh at that and I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada, because when they stop working and they get a little older, then they go uh, back to their villages and start some business and they end up making papadams. So they learn from you and they sell it back to you. He said, I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. So we had taken Srila Prabhupada some of the papadams and given it to him. The other stories that he was discussing with my mom was how the Pakistanis, even Muslim, used to stay as neighbors with the Hindus in peace. Uh, he said we, we were staying even with one wall between us. And my mother had mentioned that there were windows even in the walls that we could exchange sometimes uh, food and other uh, things that we cooked. There was a lot of conversation between them in Hindi but uh, he had also uh, at that time told my mother, so you should read my books. And my mother told him, I don't read and write. I'm illiterate. And he said, but you can speak Hindi and you can speak Indonesian. So you should learn English. And my mother told him, I'm too old. He said, it's never too old to learn. 
And she said to him, but Srila Prabhupada, I have read Mahabharata and Ramayana all my life. And he said, they are very different from my books. And it's very important that you understand what you read because there are so many translations and uh, they are very, very misleading. She had Ramayana and Mahabharata in, in Sindhi language. In fact, she used to get up very early in the morning and even since childhood I used to hear her recite those books. So I guess that was the effect on me that I came to know about Krishna consciousness. It was like um, every morning we used to hear her read those books. This is the gathering at the Lambaga Administrasi Negara. It's an auditorium beside the President's Palace in Jakarta. This is uh, his first day lecture. Kirtans were held and uh, a very strong lecture, which was in fact recorded. All the lectures were in fact recorded. I had the opportunity of being with Srila Prabhupada every minute from the morning walks that he had uh, around the place that he stayed during the first day. We went around Pasar Baru area and he had in fact uh, stopped by at one shop that had words written Toko India. Does Toko mean shop? I said yes and he said that's Indian person's shop. I said yes and miraculously uh, at that moment when we looked up, there was an Indian lady uh, folding her hands and paying her obeisances to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, it was an odd time for Indians to, to get up at that time. That day, uh, he had seen also a vegetable vendor. Uh, we could never uh, pace up with Srila Prabhupada because his walks were very, very brisk and very fast. Uh, despite his age, I was quite surprised and we were always left behind. So only Amogadas used to walk by his side. So when he saw this vegetable vendor, in fact, he had to wait for me to catch up with him. And then he went ahead and asked, uh, are those corns for sale? And I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. He said, could you bargain with him and buy some for my breakfast today morning? So I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. And he said, do you know how to put them on fire with tamarind, salt, and with chili powder? I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada, can you prepare them for me today? I said, yes. So I bought some and we took them back to the place where he was staying. There I had no coal fire, so all I could do was put some salt and chili powder. I had no tamarind, nothing else. I had put a little butter on it and I had to bake it on a gas stove. When I had prepared one, he was already insisting, where is the corn? Amogadas took it up to him. I had to rush and uh, prepare those corns. Uh, I think he had about uh, three or four that morning. Amogadas was quite surprised because uh, it's very, very seldom that Srila Prabhupada uh, eats corn. I was told later on from some other devotees that he said, that's food for animals. The next morning in fact uh, we had gone to a very large park and uh, Srila Prabhupada always took his morning walks uh, very early in the morning so that park was in fact not opened. We were going to go inside the park to park the car but the guard would not allow Srila Prabhupada to take his walk in that park. I had gone down to the guard to ask and tell him that this is uh, a priest coming from India and uh, he usually takes his morning walks and if he would permit us to just take a morning walk. And the guard totally refused. So all Srila Prabhupada did was open his window, look at the guard and said, what has happened? And the guard looking at Srila Prabhupada just was like hypnotized and immediately opened the gate for Srila Prabhupada to go in. It was like a miracle and we were all surprised. The upstairs level of Jenna trading. And this is where Prabhupada would meet guests or the minister of Hindu and Buddhist religion, the family members. This is our, our house. Family gathering, yes, this is our family now.
to my wife. She had just given birth to a boy, a baby. He told us to ask her whatever we wanted. I don't remember, but uh, it was quite interesting. We were very impressed. And he blessed all of us. I remember one question he asked me whether I believed in God. I told him, of course I believe in God. But uh, he kept on asking from me, do you, do you believe in God? Uh, this is my son. When Prabhupada arrived, um, he arrived and stayed in his room, and we were outside, and then we were all kind of resting because it was quite a, an event for us. And Prabhupada only rested about a half hour after an international flight. And then Prabhupada, we heard him going around the whole room, quite a large room he was in, switching all the lights on and off, testing all the latches, everything, all the switches and different things around the room. It was interesting. The next section shows Srila Prabhupada at the, the Hindu Bali temple at Rao Mangan. And they have a band, I think it was called a gamelan. It's a kind of music that plays percussion and gongs and different instruments. It's quite unusual. It's an undescribable, unique sound that band has. When Srila Prabhupada arrived, they uh, sat down all together and chanted the first line of the Gayatri Mantra out loud. And together, that's what they do. They sit and slowly chant the first line of Gayatri Mantra. In Srila Prabhupada's talk, he talks about the Gayatri Mantra and the meaning of Gayatri. They played their own music to greet Srila Prabhupada, but also when he sang Jai Radha Madhava, which is, he, he would always sing before speaking, he directed them to play along with him as he sang Jai Radha Madhava. But their band plays in very minor keys, and uh, it's quite an amazing sound to hear Prabhupada chanting Jai Radha Madhava and them playing those instruments at the same time. It's very unique. And then they walked Prabhupada around the outside. They have an outdoor altar with a very high structure with a chair at the top, an empty chair, and then all these kind of carvings of beings. They bring offerings and uh, they invite Lord Brahma, whoever they want to worship, to sit there. But Srila Prabhupada said they should have Radha and Krishna up there. Is it possible for only one person to be initiated? Then Amogada said, Krishna consciousness believes in quality than in quantity. And I have spoken to Srila Prabhupada and said that there is only one sincere devotee that I see worth getting an initiation from you, and he has agreed. So um, I myself, I had gone inside the room, and he had chanted on the beads. And after chanting, I had asked him the question, Srila Prabhupada, what can I do? What is my duty after this? Do I have to leave my home and come and stay at the temple? And he said, no, it's not necessary. Krishna consciousness means you have to change your consciousness. It does not matter where you stay. You just have to chant and remember Krishna all the time. That is Krishna consciousness. And I said, what is my duty? He said, if you speak Sindhi, then preach to the Indian ladies. Read my books, chant, and be happy. As a filmmaker, it was an exciting time. This was my first 16 millimeter film shot with a borrowed camera and 10 three-minute loads of film. And what better subject than Srila Prabhupada and the devotees in Mayapur during Gaur Purnim. When the devotees uh, came to Mayapur, then Prabhupada took us out on Parikrama. He took us to the different temples and showed us Lord Chaitanya's uh, historical pastime places. And then he wanted us to go out every year. So here we're going to uh, Srivas Angan, where the original Sankirtan party was held, and we're dancing very enthusiastically at the place of the original Kirtan in the garden of Srivas. Prabhupada wanted the devotees to, uh, to be engaged 
in those days, uh, there wasn't so much interaction between ISKCON and, uh, and the Gaudiya Mats, but once a year we could go and visit Lord Chaitanya's places. And that was uh, about the interaction that we had. There was a palpable consciousness that this was the fulfillment of Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur's prophecy that the devotees from the East and the West would meet in the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya and perform Harinam, Sankirtan, and this was it. And there was an awareness and the Kirtan was beyond words. This is the birthplace uh, temple. Originally, the birthplace temple was actually a grass hut because uh, Lord Chaitanya used, was born in a grass hut. And uh, then they changed it to a uh, concrete replica of a grass hut. And Prabhupada expressed his dissatisfaction that they couldn't have maintained it. It would have been nice to maintain it in its pristine form. Mayapur was uh, a cow shed and a cement go-down and a construction site. And the devotees were staying in tents. It was very austere. This is the Lotus Building, the first building. Prabhupada was very much involved in the whole construction. Every time he came, he wanted to see what was happening. He'd go on a tour of the building, see how it was going. He was personally sending the money for paying for the for the construction. He would get donations and he would send it. When the building was uh, partially finished and we already started to live in it. Then we built this little kind of a shed just to the side of the Bhajan Kutir where the art is going on. There's a lot of people there because that was Gopunima Festival. But previously, no one was coming to Mayapur. The whole of 72, practically, nobody came. And more or less, I knew everybody that was walking down that road. And there were no visitors, there were just local people. And one time, I saw some people walking down, and I thought, oh, these are not local people, because you can tell by the dress. So then they actually come in the property. And I thought, oh, they're coming in for Tarshan. And I thought, I would get it back to Godhead and see if I can give them back to Godhead when they come. So I run in the Bhajan Kutir and got it back to Godhead. And I come out, and Prabhupada was already standing there. He had come out in the Bhajan Kutir also. And he was just standing in front of the deities. And he looked at me and he said, Why are you not here? He said, He said, You see the guests are coming, and there's no one here. <laughs> the first people who've been in about a couple of weeks. He said, No one is here. He said, People are coming. He said, You should be here. <laughs> I said, I just wanted to get back to Godhead Prabhupada, and I just come out. And then he was kind of looking at me, and he seemed to be saying, what are you making all these excuses for? <laughs> he was kind of smiling. <laughs> I remember the first time I gave Prabhupada Chanamrita there, and my hand was shaking uncontrollably. <laughs> and I was looking at my hand, I was thinking, why is it happening like this? It never happened before like that. It was really just uncontrollably shaking. <laughs> he just kind of looked at me and smiled, <laughs> and he took the Chanamrita. Another time Prabhupada was sitting in the Bhajan Kutir just on the outside under the veranda with one of his godbrothers, Dhammadol Maharaj. And I went and I offered him Chanamrita. And he was just sitting there, the sun was shining in it. And he just put his head back and he opened his mouth. <laughs> and then he let me pour the Chanamrita into his mouth. Then Dhammadol Maharaj, his godbrother, did the same thing. He just put his head back and opened his mouth and I was pouring Chanamrita. In. But it was kind of a strange experience because, you know, Prabhupada, he was our lord and master, the big father figure, protector and everything, and then he's kind of acting like a little baby, and don't, you have to feed him. <laughs> it was a new experience that I had with Prabhupada. Prabhupada really liked Mayapur. You know, he seemed really relaxed in Mayapur when we would come. I remember the one time he went up to his quarters when he first got there, and 
Of course, I'd follow him in, setting everything up, and he was just looking out his window. You know, the windows, of course, were on each side of his room. So he walked in the in his door, front door, and he just looked out his window, and you know, then it was just stretches of fields everywhere. There was it was wide open and very tranquil, very peaceful. And he'd just chant, you know, and look out there. And one time he turned, and he just looked at me, and he smiled, and he said, "So, Sri Kirti Maharaj." You like it here in Mayapur? And I said, yes, Prabhupada, very much. The way his quarters were set up there, they had the padding, you know, across the entire room. So sometimes you could go in there in the middle of the day and Prabhupada would just be laying on the floor and he'd have his feet over the big bolster pillars that were against the walls. He would just move one out a little bit, so he'd just have his legs hanging over the bolster pillow. And he'd just be... Just relaxing. And his morning walk was always right out, right outside his room. As soon as he'd go down the steps, he was already on his walk, right? But he also always knew everything that was, who was around, who wasn't around, who was missing the walk. You know, because sometimes if, if he was going out, get down to the bottom of the stairs and he would ask, where's such and such? You know, where's this devotee? Where's that devotee? One time he asked, you know, he said, where's, I don't know who it was, he said, where's this devotee? And someone said, oh, he's sick, Prabhupada. And Prabhupada kind of chuckled. And I said, yes, Prabhupada, I think he has morning sickness. And then Prabhupada laughed. He said, yes, that is the difficulty. <laughs> Expected everyone to be up in the morning. And he never, never minimized that always did the opposite, you know, even with the people that traveled with him, because we were the ones affected too by that, you know, so-called jet lag and stuff as he traveled around, but he didn't, he wasn't interested in hearing about it. Prabhupada was so happy that we had cows, he said, this is very auspicious, he said, if the cows are grazing on the land where we're going to build the temple, then... Uh, by passing cow dung and walking over the land, it's going to make it very auspicious for the temple. Prabhupada wanted us to feed the local villagers, so we had, uh, even before we had a building, we had a big pot for cooking and distributing prasadam. Prabhupada used to take, go on walks, and he liked to walk along the uh, pathways in between the fields, he called these the little highways. As he'd be walking, then the villagers would offer him respect and pay obeisances. It was a very informal, friendly environment with all the local villagers. Prabhupada would walk out in the fields and then he'd look and say, here there'll be a spiritual city one day. I have seen that Prabhupada morning walking time, one um, villager, he is taking some uh, sobji, vegetables, to nearby market. Then Prabhupada stops suddenly. Then he says, why are you going? I have to sell this vegetable to the market. Then Prabhupada says, why not you are giving to the temple? You can serve Radha Govindu uh, by giving your vegetables. Then he has agreed, he purchased all the vegetables, big bucket. He purchased and he told Jai Pataka, then Jai Pataka paid his uh, amount. He told that vegetable man, please you come every day and talk to the temple manager and give sabji, vegetable, fresh vegetables to the Radha Govinda. He has all the time mind to give fresh flowers, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits. I have seen also sometimes in Calcutta, somebody purchase not fresh fruits. So he was very annoyed. Why you do not buy the fresh fruits for Radha Govindu? So I have seen the same thing. Fresh vegetables, he likes to offer Krishna. Prabhupada was going on a walk and he, he called me because he said he wanted me to take the part of the material scientist. Then I said to him, all right, speaking as a scientist, I said, we will not argue whether a soul exists or not. We'll, we'll just take it as a given that a soul exists. So my question to you is that 
we will create the right properties in our laboratory and in our test tubes so that your Krishna will send a soul into a test tube. Is that premise accepted by you? Is that acceptable? Because if I was thinking, if I can get Prabhupada to say yes, then I'll say then, then we have created life. And then Prabhupada just said, you rascal scientist, you will not tell Krishna where he has to send a soul. <laughs> Prabhupada sometimes used to go for a morning walk there on the Ganges. It used to take about almost 20 minutes to walk there. But that time it was way, way over the other side. And one time actually they all took bath there. They were all sannyasis, I think, or at least brahmacharyas and sannyasis. And Prabhupada said, you can take a bath if you like. They said, Prabhupada, we didn't bring any gumptures. I said, it's okay, you have no one is around. You can go in your coping. <laughs> so everybody jumped in the ganga, and then Prabhupada went in also. He had a gumption. His servant bought him a gumption. And he, went, he also went in. And then they started fighting, splashing and everything like that. And Prabhupada said that, this is okay. He said, Lord Chaitanya, he was also doing this. Then someone started to splash Prabhupada, Madhavisa Maharaj, I believe. Mildly, in a playful way, but he was giving little splashes with his hand. But Prabhupada said, don't become too familiar with your guru. He reprimanded him. And Guru Kripa and they were pouring water on Prabhupada's head with their hands, chanting Chintamani Prakara Sadma Sukhalp, chanting Chintamani Press. Another time he said, if you build a road from our ashram to the Ganga, a nice road, he said, I will come every morning for a walk here. And another time he said, be careful, because the Ganga could come and take away all of our property. For several years the Ganga was constantly changing course. Then the course was diverted right over to the property. But then the government took action. They made some proper embankments there with bricks. And, but it came very, very close, right up to the road. But now it's gone back to a steady course, which is a very good symptom. Because in the Nabalit Dhammahapmya, it's predicted that for several hundred years, about 400 years, the Ganga will constantly do this, actually flood the whole area. And then after 400 years, Bhakti Thakur mentions, then she'll go back to a steady course again. And then he said, many, many bathing ghats will be built on the Ganga. And many, many temples will be built. And many uh, household dwellings will come up. And there will be, of course, the Anbud Mandir, a very astonishing temple, will rise from which service to Lord Chaitanya will spread all over the world. So now we're seeing this. Now the Ganga is more or less settled. There are permanent ghats being made. Discon's made one. Madhav Maharaj has made a permanent gap. And there's hundreds and hundreds of dwelling places now, all over the place. We have our Grihastapara. Then just outside the master plan of our project, there's so many houses. And the community members also of the Chaitanya Mata and Jogbi, Gaudiya Mata, they're also building little houses. There's hundreds of little houses. It's all protected by Nityananda Prabhu. So these are good signs. One day it was a Govardhan Puja and we built a big mountain of rice and we fed many people and the people took their leaf plates after taking prasadam and then they threw it behind the building and then Prabhupada uh, was living up on the second floor and we were sitting in the room together and then he heard dogs barking and kids shouting and so then he got up and walked back on the veranda uh, behind his room and he looked over and he saw that there was this big pile of leaf plates of people that had eaten their meal and there was little scraps on the plates. So then uh, there were some very poor children with sticks in their hand fighting off some very hungry dogs trying to get the scraps of food that people hadn't finished eating on their plate. When Prabhupada saw and how these children were so hungry that they had to eat the things that people threw away and how they were fighting with the dogs to get these scraps of food. Tears swelled in his eyes and he said, we had to see that nobody goes hungry within a 10 mile radius. The temple is the house of God, 
God's everyone's father, Krishna's everyone's father, so in the presence of the father, the son doesn't go hungry. So like that, we have to make an arrangement that people get fed. And so that was uh, inspiration for regular prasadam distribution. And I remember one time watching Srila Prabhupada, while all the people from the villages were out taking prasadam, he would go to the little window in the hut and then look out and watch them. And then I, I would remember the verse, Chatu Vidha Sri Bhagavat Prasada, that the spiritual master is very satisfied if he sees the devotees taking prasadam. And he looked very happy, he looked very satisfied. Prabhupada was trying to involve his god brothers and work cooperatively with them. Especially he made a lot of effort with uh, Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj because they were very old friends. He used to come and visit Prabhupada in his house and stay at their guest house. So he was inviting him to come even to the West and see the temple, see how the preaching was going on. But he, he declined, he said it was too far. So he invited him to come over to Mayapur. So he agreed to come. So then Prabhupada had him share a seat on the Vyasasan with him. And he was very, very accommodating and loving to him. Prabhupada invited all of his god brothers to come. And they were all coming, one at a time or two at a time, throughout that whole morning. And he spoke to everyone and he said exactly the same thing to everyone. He said, we're having some success in our preaching. And so we have some good facilities now. And he said, and you are all experienced preachers. You have been trained by our Prabhupada. He said, so I have all these buses coming out. It's that time when they were bringing all those Mercedes buses. He said, I have many buses. So I can give you all a bus and I will give you men. And you just go out and preach. He said, if you have any problem in your temple for maintenance, he said, I will also give you men for your temples and to help you maintain in the temple. He said, there's only one condition. He said that you distribute my books. My books are to be distributed on these parties. He said, but you will lead, you will preach. Unfortunately, not one of them accepted his offer. And Prabhupada really tried to get them to work together again. Walking along the Hooghly. You know, the Hooghly is the Ganges River, which I really enjoyed because Prabhupada would stop sometimes and have intimate moments where he would look, you know, look at the water. And you could just imagine that Prabhupada sailed down that water, you know, when he left. He left from Calcutta, right? So. You know, that's the place. And now he's back here again with his disciples. In Calcutta, there were so many parks Prabhupada would walk in. You know, back in the day when Prabhupada was growing up, he said Calcutta was their model city of what they you know, wanted to create in India. They had many beautiful parks. You know, every few blocks there was another park. Of course, when we were there in the 70s, they, you know, they looked a bit different than they did, but he said it was a beautiful city. That was their model, he said, of what they, what they wanted to accomplish in India everywhere, and they did it in Calcutta. Prabhupada used to take his morning walk quite often in a little park just around the corner to the temple. I think it's called 
Das Pier Park. And there was a lake in the middle of that park. So Papa would walk around that lake a few times. So on this one occasion, quite a large number of devotees came for the walk, maybe as many as 40. And uh, Papa was walking around, not saying anything, just walking around the park. And uh, he would come back to the starting point where there was a little gate which we would go through. And then he would set off again. Papa wasn't speaking anything, he was chanting Japa. So after about four times around, I was noticing that many devotees were kind of dropping, dropping up, going back to the temple for one reason or another. I went on a couple more times around the park. It was going on quite a while. So I was still following on. And it got down to the point where there was about six of us left. And we're going around, and suddenly Papa had stopped and turned around and looked at us. And he said, he said, oh, all the others have given up. He said, just see how easily we give up. And then he was very silent and turned around and started walking again. And we followed him then when he came back to the gate, we went back to the temple. I was in Srila Prabhupada's room with him in Calcutta. I was a temple president there, so I got access to Srila Prabhupada. So I went in, and one day I was just there with him alone, and for some reason I asked this question, I don't know why, but I did. I said, Srila Prabhupada, when you leave us, who will succeed you? And he said, that will be revealed to you. And then he looked at me, he said, you'll become guru. And then he said, I want all of my disciples to become guru. And then he said, Jari deko tahe kaha Krishna upadesh, amara agyai guru han tare edesh which is the verse that uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spoke to the South Indian Brahmin. Uh, when he left South India and he was lamenting, what am I to do? And Lord Chaitanya said, whoever you see, tell them about Krishna. Whoever you speak to, tell them about the instructions of Krishna given in the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Bhagavad Gita. And on my order, you deliver this land. So Prabhupada quoted that verse and he said, this is how this Krishna consciousness movement will be spread. I was one of the few foreigners who learned how to drive in India, mainly because I drove the, our vans, and I don't think there was very many others who drove Prabhupada in India. Prabhupada usually had a driver. But anyway, we drove, and Yadavar, one day he accompanied us with Rupanuga. It's just Rupanuga, me and you. And there was very few of us, so he, there was no talking or conversations. But it was the best morning walks because of the area where we were in Calcutta. This was Prabhupada's hometown. It was a little bewildering. There was all these neon flowers, <laughs> neon decorations, plastic flowers, um, lots of electrical cords twangled and dangled. I, I remember at one point the devotion that was there. It hit me. What was going on was, you know, pure devotion to these deities. And this family had been absorbed in devotion to these deities for centuries. And the Prabhupada was absorbed in devotion for these deities. You know, so that suddenly, you know, the picture changed. <laughs> then I remember they sat us down and they were serving us prasad. And it was a beautiful Bengali feast. And it was served, you know, on banana leaves with such respect for Srila Prabhupada. And the respect from Prabhupada was transferred to us. They were very we probably would use the word aristocratic, but they were very aristocratic. And their affection to Srila Prabhupada was definitely apparent, as was his towards them. At the Radhagovinda Temple, Prabhupada's childhood temple in North Calcutta, Prabhupada did a series of lectures in the evening. The Mullock family, which was the family he was related to, who owned the temple in one of the great Zamindar families of of Bengal during the time of the British Raj 
Uh, they lived across the street, and of course, Prabhupada was raised in their house. Uh, they all came to the program. The whole uh, atmosphere was, it was like Prabhupada was the grandfather or the great-grandfather, and they were so respectful. You know, that the way they came in, their heads were always covered, uh, the way they, the women bowed down, the men were, uh, you know, nicely dressed and standing in the background, and everyone was very attentive to Prabhupada because he was their, their relative who was now world famous. Prabhupada's mood at, at this uh, meeting was very familial. He was very gentle with everyone. It was, it was just like family. There was a very loving side to this, the whole relationship between him and the Mullik family. And of course, those deities, Radha Govinda, were Prabhupada's childhood deities. This was the temple where he played as a child, where he had his Rathiyatra festival, and he worshipped these beautiful deities that they have there still. Radha Govinda, they're the deities that Prabhupada said called him back to India. You know, in the 60s, he went back to India, he said, Radha Govinda have called me back. And that's when he started all his major Indian preaching. Prabhupada came to Calcutta with Pradumna in 1973, April, and Pradumna came up to me and said, how would you like to come with Prabhupada and type Chaitanya Charitamrita? He says, okay, tomorrow uh, we're going to um, Mayapur, so you have to learn how to read Bengali and then you can come with Prabhupada. I said, okay, no problem. <laughs> so he gave me a Bengali book, I learned how to read Bengali and I was off with Prabhupada the next day because like, we never thought anything was impossible, that if Prabhupada wanted us to do something, then impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary. So yeah, no problem. I learned to read Bengali, and I get to go with Prabhupada. In Calcutta, um, it was a challenging place for us. Something about the temple, and at least at one period, um, everyone was sick. Everybody had dysentery, and the service, you know, there wasn't enough people to do the basic service. So, it was a challenge, and Banu Swami was there. And Banu Swami, as I remember, is a Naishtika Brahmachari. And through all of this, he never got sick, he never lost his focus, he remained active, and when others were down in their attitude, consciousness, he was never affected by it. And at one point, he's the only person who was well and up serving. Prabhupada made note one day. And he said, just see, he said, this is the value of brahmacharya. He said, because he is brahmachari, he is able to circumvent all the challenges of the world and continue steady in his service. This is the value of brahmacharya. I get to have a private darshan of Srila Prabhupada. Of course, his servant was in the room, and myself and Prabhupada. And when I first um, came before him, you know, with what I thought was just like this huge life-ending problem, you know, my whole consciousness absorbed and being in anxiety about this problem, all of a sudden, when I got in there, the whole problem just like shrunk down to the, the size of the water and the hoof print of a calf. This huge unsolvable anxiety just became insignificant. And there I was like totally embarrassed. All of a sudden it didn't seem like something I should bother Prabhupada with, you know, and, and I was so embarrassed. But here I am, I had disturbed him. And at that time, Prabhupada communicated something to me. I, you've probably heard from other devotees how sometimes Prabhupada would communicate without speaking. Prabhupada became a mirror, and I think that's a, a guru's function to be like a mirror to the disciple. He was like a mirror. He was showing me my, my spiritual situation and I had this like really esoteric like internal vision like for a few seconds of myself being this brilliant diamond-like spiritual spark within my heart but I was covered over with just like mounds and heaps and heaps of dirt and I also had a vision of Srila Prabhupada sitting there the same brilliant spiritual spark only completely clear of any covering and, and he communicated to me with that vision that, that I was just like him. But I was 
covered and that all I needed to do was to follow his instructions and I would become completely uncovered like him. And that was such an intense realization. And I thought, oh, how can I bring up my petty, you know, <laughs> mundane problem? And, but like I said, after I'd gone and disturbed and he was sitting there expectantly, then I did. I like blurted it out. The most significant thing about that whole experience was, was that like internal mirror-like vision that he gave me of myself and himself. Winter of 1973, uh, Vishnu Jana Swami's bus had burned down somewhere in America and while Karanda and the BBT were building him a new bus, he came to sail down the Ganges and do uh, Harinam Sankirtan and Prasadam and distribution and he had a slideshow to show these villages. And Vishnu John was amazing, doing kirtan through the villages. I mean, people were asking us to take their children with us, and, you know, they were just in shock. And we'd have a program every night with a big slideshow. I mean, and show them London Rathiatra and San Francisco Rathiatra. They were blown away that, you know, that their Hinduism was actually, you know, spreading all over the world. Because we were the first Western Hindus they'd ever seen. And it wasn't just that we were a handful, we represented this movement with temples and festivals all over the world. So, of course, who's the person responsible for all this is Prabhupada. I mean, the villagers were just enormously impressed. Anyway, it was, we sailed down the Ganges for 40 days and nights, and we got stopped in northern Bengal by a huge dam called Faraka Barrage. So then we took trips down to Calcutta, where we met Prabhupada. So we had some kind of, you know, little camera with us, but somebody had a shaky hand, it all came out looking like ghostly images, so we didn't have anything to show Prabhupada. But um, when we were reporting in the room about it, Vishnu Jana Swami said that we had distributed 500 sets of japa beads. And Prabhupada looked very concerned, said, you cannot do that, now they think you are their guru. <laughs> So he was a little upset that we didn't know the subtleties of Indian culture, that if you give someone beads and tell them to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, you've just given them Hare Nam initiation, and that's how they see it. So I think there must be a lot of villages along the Ganges where they have this memory of this uh, bronze god from the West who uh, looked like Lord Chaitanya and gave them initiation. Shri Prabhupada one time he singled me out in one of the darshans. He said to me, Oh, my sister tells me you speak Bhagavatam very nicely. And so when he said that, I, I didn't know what to say because I never spoke Bhagavatam, what to speak of nicely. And so I didn't know, I was just completely bewildered and puzzled, you know, why he said that. But then it was in Calcutta that I had been reading Krishna book in front of Pishima because it was Janamashtami in 1972. And um, what we had to do, all the devotees were reading Krishna book from morning till night. And so when it was my turn to read, I was reading Raslila. And she was my only audience. There were hardly any people then. There's nobody in the temple in Calcutta those days. So she was about the only one sitting in front of me. And I was reading in English, and she didn't know a word of English. But I was being real dramatic, you know, Krishna left the gopis, and they were crying, and then she was crying and crying and crying, although she didn't know any English. So uh, she understood the mood of it. <laughs> and then she must have told Prabhupada that I speak Bhagavatam. But then now, 30 years later, I, th I thought about what Prabhupada said. And in Prabhupada's lifetime, I never spoke Bhagavatam, and even for 27 years since when I was a devotee, I never spoke Bhagavatam. But now I'm speaking Bhagavatam. Just this year, when I was speaking Bhagavatam in Vaichi, it struck me that Prabhupada's words came true, <laughs> even though I, I didn't understand what he, you know, what is he talking about? But then I thought, well, wow, pure devotee's words must be true, that it has to happen. And even though I had no plan of ever speaking Bhagavatam, but it happened anyway by Krishna's arrangement. We were in Prabhupada's room in Calcutta, and. Uh... Nanda Kumar brought in a letter for him to sign. And Prabhupada uh, looked at the letter, two-page letter, looked it over and then grabbed the pen and goes, A, and then C, and then this big Bhaktivedanta, and then big capital Swami. 
And there was a life member there, and I was there looking at this, and we kind of looked at each other, you know, when we saw the signature. And Prabhupada noticed it, and he looked at the life member, and he said, yes. When I was at Scottish Churches College in Calcutta, my professor witnessed my signature also, and he said, ah, that is a royal signature. <laughs> Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we went to greet Srila Prabhupada at the airport, and this is, of course, the very, very first time I ever saw him. So I was a little anxious, and uh, I remember they uh, rolled out a long uh, red carpet, and uh, I remember my first impression. For some reason, I had expected him to be very tall. I don't know why. And I remember thinking, oh, he's so short. <laughs> But there was something so very regal about his um, carriage. And then uh, he went to sit down on the dais. They had actually brought a little uh, sort of wooden dais for him to sit on because there was going to be an interview. It was a television interview. And um, first there was, of course, the kirtan, and then everyone sat down. And, of course, all the people in the airport in the background wondering, what's going on here? And uh, so I was just mesmerized watching him. It was like watching a performance for me, a uh, solo performance on the stage. And he sat down uh, with the greatest of uh, elegancy and ease. And uh, someone offered him a, uh, a silver goblet of water. And I remember him holding it up. And the stream of water flowed like a fountain right in his mouth. And uh, it was just so elegant. And I, and I just thought, wow. <laughs> you know, being, in, being uh, in the theater profession for some years, it was like, boy, that person really has a, a lot of grace to be able to do that in front of all these people, just everybody's eyes on him, with not even a, a string of nervousness or tension or anything like that. And then they offered him a plate of fruit, and he um, very delicately just picked up a piece of fruit and just sort of popped it in his mouth and sat there and chewed it, and everyone was watching him. And, and no discomfort, you know, no nervousness or anxiety. He just finished eating that little piece of fruit, and then he was looking around, one after the other, at the faces, very peacefully and quietly, really looking, taking all the time that he... Uh, wanted to. I was just, from a material standpoint, completely impressed. <laughs> One time I purposefully brought Prabhupada's vases of flowers back to his altar late because I knew that he would be arriving. So I was the only one left in his quarters, and I had dared to do that because I thought that was a good chance for me to meet Prabhupada face to face. So I came late with the flowers, returning them to his altar just as he was walking into his sitting room. So I placed them on the altar and then paid my obeisances. And um, Srila Prabhupada was still standing. He hadn't sat down behind his desk, and he said, and what is your name? And I told him my name was Hari Puja and that I had just gotten second initiation. And I thanked him. And he shook his head like he did side to side. And he said, thank you. And then I left. <laughs> I was very happy that I had got to talk to Srila Prabhupada face to face. The next day in his lecture, I can't remember it, but the idea was that Prabhupada had mentioned that even a sincere flower girl can make progress and go back to Gladhead. So, of course, I was thinking that he was recognizing me. 
I had just graduated from Yale University. I had been living in the temple for three weeks, but I was always afraid that my ex-fiance, who I had just ended the engagement a few weeks ago by slipping away to live in the temple, <laughs> uh, I was always afraid she'd come to the temple and drag me out. <laughs> So I prayed to Radha Govinda, Sri Sri Radha Govinda, please Krishna, get me out of this one and I promise you never again. <laughs> a few weeks later Prabhupada came and I was sitting in front of him as he gave a Sunday feast lecture and Prabhupada began to roar with great transcendental strength that if you're optimistic about material life, you're an animal, if you're a human being, you must be pessimistic. While he was roaring like that, I felt this tap on my shoulder. And I looked, there she was right behind me. So all this is going on right in front of Prabhupada. <laughs> so I kind of looked at her and Prabhupada continued to roar. And I didn't bat an eye. And I just turned right back and looked at Prabhupada. And I could see out of the corner of my eye that she was about to burst out crying in the middle of the temple room. Like, what's going on here? Here's my dearly beloved, you know. and. Now he doesn't even blink an eye at me. He's just totally absorbed in this person. So she left. And Prabhupada went on to explain with less fire. <laughs> Material life, yes, everything's pessimistic. But in Krishna consciousness, everything is optimistic. <laughs> so after that, I remember the kirtan we had for the deities. And I remember dancing in ecstasy. Thanking Krishna, I'm free, I'm free, Prabhupada did it, I'm free, I'm free. <laughs> One time I was on a walk with Prabhupada in Brooklyn. And it was one of those walks where Prabhupada would drive to his destination and then walk and then come back. And as we were coming around the corner, just in front of the temple, Prabhupada saw that there was a boy who was mailing a letter, but he was a small boy, and so he couldn't reach the, the box, and his father was picking him up, and the boy was dropping the letter in the box. And Prabhupada saw this, and he just became absorbed in seeing it. Of course, how long does it take to, to mail a letter? It's only a few moments, but Prabhupada just became absorbed, and again, it seemed like it was so much time. His eyes became very wide, and, and became sparkly, and he was seemed just as if he were remembering something or... And I was thinking, what is Prabhupada thinking of? You know, something from his childhood or what? And the scene ended and Prabhupada said, the little boy, by his own strength, he cannot do. But the affectionate father, when he helps, then it is possible. We were going to um, do a performance for him the first evening of Krishna Kidnaps Rukmini. But I really felt uh, that he could see into me. There was nothing that I could hide. Then I was thinking, oh my God, I'm going to be playing the part of Princess Rukmini, who's an expansion of the goddess of fortune. And oh, it's ridiculous. What am I doing? You know, it's just going to be a farce. But anyway, it was planned and, you know, the show must go on. So there I was. And, and the scene opens with myself sitting on the floor by myself, writing the letter to Krishna. And um, I could feel my right knee beginning to shake out of nervousness. And then I remembered something my director said. He said, whatever comes up for you, just use it in the part. Find some way to integrate it into the role. You know, and then I just realized, well, she probably was in a very anxious state. I mean, here she was to be married to someone she didn't want to be married to, and she was totally anxious. And also I noticed as my eyes went up, even though you don't really look at anybody, you still sort of have a feeling. And as my eyes passed Srila Prabhupada sitting there and moved up, just this ease came over me. It was like he put this blessing on me or something. And I just forgot everything, and I just became Rukmini. And uh, was able to just play with total abandon. 
just totally get into the part. And then we finished, and there was grand applause and everything, and we went down to the dressing room, and I was completely drenched with sweat. <laughs> and uh, we were waiting, just taking our makeup off and so forth, and then Shruti Kirti came in and started telling us everything that Prabhupada said. And I was real excited and everything. He said, Prabhupada said, this is better than reading my books. It's better than reading my books because it sticks in the mind, because you have a vision. And he said, the, seeing these is like windows to the spiritual world. So people just don't hear it, but they actually have an experience. And then I got the, the wonderful compliment when he said, Rukmini, she was the best. And... Uh, I thought, wow, well, after all that anxiety I went through, and then he was actually pleased. And then, of course, there was a little part of me that thought, well, he's just saying that because he knows I need to hear it. <laughs> but then I also understood when you use whatever talent you have in Krishna's service, that is the best. So it didn't matter whatever I was thinking. And he actually wanted us to go with him and travel with him all over the world. I think his next destination was Africa. He wanted to take us with him, and he said there should always be, you know, kirtan, lecture, performance, and prasad. It just didn't work out at that time. But um, I realized the importance of cultural events in the presentation of Krishna consciousness that Prabhupada really wanted. And Srila Prabhupada was working on one of the chapter, or some of the chapters of Chaitanya Charitamrita, we had a recording device. It was big. I mean, it was like, you know, several feet wide. So Srila Prabhupada would dictate Chaitanya Charitamrita, and as soon as he was finished, Prajumna would bring it up to me, and I would immediately transcribe it using this big contraption. We didn't have a dictaphone. I would just, like, use the foot pedal, starting it, stopping it, starting it, stopping it. But we did it right away as soon as Srila Prabhupada was finished with it, and then Prajumna would bring Srila Prabhupada the transcription back, and Srila Prabhupada said that he was so encouraged because I was doing it so fast that it made him start doing two tapes a day. That was my very best memory ever. <laughs> I was in Atlanta. It was summertime, I remember that. And I uh, was walking up the street. And a devotee opened the window and stuck his head out and yelled at the top of his lungs, Balavanta, Prabhupada's on the phone which was just a shock of my life. So I ran with wings on my feet up and got the phone. He was, wasn't actually probably on the phone. It was his secretary on the phone at his request. Probably was in the room. And the secretary said, probably wants to know if you can come to New York right away. And I said, of course. So I dropped everything, went and got on the plane, flew to New York, and probably wanted to discuss politics. Actually, what happened is um, I wrote to him and suggested that I could run for mayor of Atlanta. It would be a good preaching platform. And he wrote back with the most overwhelming enthusiasm I'd ever experienced. And I, you know, I, I took one step to him. He took 100 steps to me. But uh, the broad discussion, I remember, all I remember is basically, uh, he said, so what do they say about our program? I said, probably they say it's not practical. He says, yes, it is not practical because they will not accept it. If they would accept it, it would be very practical. I remember one devotee, we were discussing the Godway Trust Party, and the devotee said, Prabhupada, when we take over the government, we'll outlaw all these religions. Prabhupada said, no, why? We only want to see that they are following their religion. So Prabhupada was not for one religion taking over the government. He fully uh, supported freedom of religion. And in fact, he made it clear many times and told us, that this is not a religion. This is, this is a process of spiritual realization which is applicable to any religion. So yeah, he made it very clear that in, you know, in terms of politics, we're not interested in uh, changing people's religion or taking over the government for one religion as opposed to another religion. We just would like to see that the leaders of human society are enlightened personalities, whatever religion they come from. And the Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam and the Chanting Hare Krishna facilitates that process. When Prabhupada would come to the temple in New York, one of the first things that 
he would like to do was to speak with the artists and see what paintings had been done. Because his translation was such an important part of his service to his spiritual master, he was always very enthusiastic to see what progress we were making. And on one occasion, we were all sitting in his quarters and the walls of his quarters were lined with the paintings. And that was one of my favorite times. Maybe there were eight or 10 of us that were working, doing the paintings for Bhagavatam at the time. And we had the opportunity just to sit with him and discuss each individual painting and he would make suggestions on them and, and corrections. Whenever I was painting, I was always listening to Prabhupada, either listening to Prabhupada chanting or Prabhupada's lectures. And from the time I went into the art department in the morning to the time I left, I always was listening to Prabhupada. And sometimes I would be sitting there painting or just you know, meditating on what I was going to be painting. And I would think how fortunate I was just to be able to hear Prabhupada and just wishing that the whole world could hear the way I could hear and, and have that experience. I remember one time I was doing a drawing of Lord Chaitanya, it was a drawing for the painting for Chaitanya Charitamrita of Lord Chaitanya dancing in front of the Rathiyatra cart. And all of a sudden I felt that I wasn't doing the drawing. I realized the drawing was being done by some power other than me and that my hand was just, was being guided. I remember when Srila Prabhupada came to Henry Street and uh, we were so happy with everything the way it was going. We thought uh, we'd reached such a pinnacle in our development. And uh, Srila Prabhupada said, yes, everything is very nice here. Now go back to Manhattan. And he said, Brooklyn sounds like a poor man's temple. So he sent Sham Sundar, who happened to be traveling with him at the time, back into Manhattan and he started looking for buildings. And he, Sham Sundar started realizing we're talking about millions of dollars here. Anyways, we were left with the task after uh, they left, and uh, we started collecting happily uh, for this uh, monumental move. And uh, we were collecting and collecting over a period of uh, months and then even over a year. And it was a joyous crusade. Uh, but at one point, uh, we were a little wary if possibly the money that was being collected would be diverted into maybe other activities. And so luckily, one day, we got a call from Srila Prabhupada, and he ordered that all the money we had collected all be sent to India, and that we could start collecting again for a New York temple. Uh, some devotees, I don't know how they all felt about it, I was elated. I knew that Srila Prabhupada was specifically, almost as if to say, sticking out his hand, reaching out and saying, give me the money, and we were in effect putting it right into his hands. So we felt really good about that. And it turned out, uh, that uh, all these wonderful devotees, uh, their energies went toward the purchase of the Juhu property in Bombay. All the New York Temple money purchased that, and the extra money that was left over built the Lotus Building, the first temple building in the Sridhar Mayapur complex. Of course, this Vyatra became very famous because um, Prabhupada never sat in his Vyasasan, which was there, and, and walked and danced the entire way. And what was the amazing thing was just days before and weeks before he had been very ill, he was in Mayapur in Calcutta, and he asked the leaders what he should do because he was being invited to the Rathiyatra in London, and he was also being invited, I believe, to Australia to rest and recuperate from his illness. And I remember he, you know, told them to, which he would do sometimes, he said, talk amongst yourselves and tell me what you think. And I remember massaging him that day when he said that, and he said to me, he said, so, he said, what do you think? You know, should I go to London for the Rathiyatra or should I go to Australia and rest? And I had been with Prabhupada about a year. So I already had an idea that he was going to go to the Rathiyatra. And that's what Prabhupada did. He preached. There's no possibility of him passing up such a big opportunity for preaching. 
And I said that, I said, well, if you go to London, I said, there'll be thousands of people there at the Rathiatra Festival that you can preach to. And of course, and if you go to Australia, that won't be there. And he just said, yes. He said, that's, that's right. So then later on in the afternoon, he called everyone and he just told them, he said, we're going to London, to Rathiatra. I picked Prabhupada up at Heathrow Airport in a helicopter and flew him into the front lawn. He landed in a helicopter. <laughs> and the entire trip from the airport, it was storming. And this little helicopter, uh, I think it was just two passengers, just Prabhupada and I, was moving like, you know, really uh, abruptly. I was getting sick. It was like being on the inside of a basketball or something, you know, rotating. And I looked over at Prabhupada thinking, oh my God, he must be getting ill. And he was just as calm as could be, and just enjoying the ride. <laughs> and we were just skimming over the treetops at a very high speed. And we landed there on the lawn. Prabhupada used to t say to people, I have arrived in a helicopter. <laughs> So we just ran back round to the lawn where they were going to land and yelled to everyone that he was coming because at the manor there's uh, two small airfields nearby so there's actually quite a lot of small planes and noise from the sky and maybe it hadn't been noticed so we ran around telling everyone and just a few seconds later the helicopter landed and I don't know if it had been raining or what, but the grass was very wet and we were running towards the helicopter and the, the pilot of the helicopter was flipping out because the blades were still turning and uh, I was just so eager to get there to see Prabhupada again and I just went flying. I, I don't know if I tripped or slipped or what but I went face down on the grass and we could, we could see Prabhupada's, just his head um, through the window of the door. And when he came out, he looked quite shaken. And I heard afterwards that Prabhupada said, I never want to travel this way again. So when he arrived, we were very worried that uh, he wasn't feeling well. Here, here we are pulling up to the, the beginning of the parade. I'm driving the car and Prabhupada is getting out. I continued in this car through the whole parade following the cart in case Prabhupada needed to be taken to rest somewhere. I mean, here he is, arrived from, from Calcutta overnight on the plane. He hasn't rested at all. So we figured, you know, either he, he can sit on the cart for a while and then get off and we'll put him in the car and, and take him somewhere to rest. But he surprised us all and never even got up on the cart to sit. He danced and walked the entire distance for hours on a hot July day in, in London muggy day. And then at the end, he sat up on the lions at Trafalgar Square and talked and preached strongly. What an effort. Our efforts pale by comparison. My uncle, he left me 10,000 pounds in a will. Which is a lot of money in those days, 73. So I, there I was, I was a Brahma tree. And I was initiated. But then all of a sudden, Shamasundra, the GBC, said, Mahavishnu, we want to put you in charge of Rathiatra. So then I thought, well, let me spend it on the Rathiatra festival. So there I was, I was spending like water. I was arranging for a big pandal in uh, Trafalgar Square, and publicity and, and all the buses in London, paying for a film to be made. I was walking around with the bills hanging out of my pocket. <laughs> As the procession began, all of a sudden, the sun burst through. So it had been like a very gloomy looking day. Suddenly the sun was just shining on the whole affair. And Prabhupada took his coat off. And I'm right by Srila Prabhupada. You can see in that picture, I'm right there. I just put my arms out and he put, he put his coat on my arms. Somehow or other, Krishna let me be right by Srila Prabhupada during the whole procession. 
This was a victory for Prabhupada. This Rathiatra going right down, like the main, the main byways there in, in London to Trafalgar Square. And, you know, Prabhupada saw to it that it was a very grand event. And he just, he just danced and walked the entire way, even though he was going to go recuperate somewhere from his illness because he was, you know, supposedly weak. During the, the parade itself, I was in the crowd distributing some of these magazines. And suddenly, all the hairs on my body just stood on end. I felt so different. And I turned around to look behind me, and right behind me was Srila Prabhupada dancing. So I felt Srila Prabhupada before I saw him. That's how strong of a personality he was. The Bobbies, I guess, you know, I guess they could see that I was his assistant, you know, his servant. And they said to me, you have to tell your leader to sit down because he's making too much of a commotion in the streets. We need to get order in the streets. They didn't like, you know, they considered it very disorderly, all this dancing around. <laughs> And uh, I ignored them once, you know, because I thought, I can't say anything to Prabhupada, you know. So then they kept coming up to me. This one officer kept saying, you know, you have to tell him, you know, you have to tell him. And uh, so finally I went up to Prabhupada, and he was just like this as he was dancing around and walking. And I went up to him, and I, I t from behind, I tapped him on the shoulder. And he turned around and looked at me, and I said, Prabhupada, I said, they're saying you have to sit down in your seat. And he just kind of like, just paid no attention at all and just spun back around and continued to dance, you know. So I just shrugged my shoulders. I went back up to the Bobby and I said, if you want him to stop, I said, you tell him. I said, because he won't listen to me. So and then he didn't go up and then they just, they just let it go on. And when those Kirtan started to get going, now, I was supposed to be directing the parade, because I was like in charge of the whole thing. And then uh, all the senior devotees were surrounding Prabhupada in these huge kirtans. And uh, you know, I couldn't do anything about it. They were all senior to me. I was just a junior devotee. And then the police kept coming up to me and saying, when he, he jumps up and down and, and he looks at uh, <coughs> Jagannath on the Rathiatra cart, then you're stopping the, all the traffic in London. Please do something. <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> Finally, at one point, uh, he motions to us, and he wanted us all, to, all the kirtan devotees to come down off the Rathiatra car. He said, come on down. And uh, so he came down and had kirtan with Prabhupada right down there on the street. Everyone came off the cart. And then we're holding hands and keeping a circle around Prabhupada to keep um, from anyone bumping into Srila Prabhupada. And it wasn't until actually later on, when the Chaitanya Charitamrita was translated by Srila Prabhupada, that we uh, realized that this was all the same as in Chaitanya Charitamrita. We spent weeks advertising the Rath Yatra this year. We called it London's Summer Festival. And we, we had stickers made, orange circular stickers, and we stuck them on every available surface, you know, the lamp posts shop windows, somebody went on all the underground trains and stuck them on all the doors of the underground trains and the whole of London was just covered in the things. <laughs> we were surprised actually that more people didn't come. We thought, you know, there'd be a hundred thousand. <laughs> Everyone directed Prabhupada towards the Vyasasan and he looked at it, then he looked around. And then he just shook his head a little and started to walk. And then when everyone realized that Prabhupada was going to walk in front of the cart with everybody else, there was like a wave went through the devotees as they heard that this was happening. Everyone started to dance. And it was quite amazing that the, there was this seemingly very small old man in the middle of all these tall, young, strong Western men and he was completely directing them. Just with a flick of his finger, they would lift off the ground and dance and spin and, and do whatever. And the, the number of madangas that were being played and the vigor that they were being played with wasn't that the kirtan was particularly fast, but the way everyone was playing the madangas, their, their hearts were in their hands the way they were playing them. 
to please Prabhupada with the kirtan. And from time to time, he would actually start dancing, jumping off the ground himself with his arms raised. And when that happened, the devotees just went wild. And it was as if we were flying. There was no ground beneath our feet. There was no time, no space, no nothing. There was just pure joy and happiness and, and Prabhupada. At some points when he would look at Lord Jagannath, it was, a, it was a face of a man in love, the way he looked at Jagannath. Sometimes the Rathiatra cart would fall behind the Kirtan party by quite a distance. So Prabhupada would stop the Kirtan party in, a, in one spot and wait for the cart to catch up. He would sometimes raise his hands as if he was beckoning to Lord Jagannath to come. And once the cart caught right up to the party, then he'd move on again. That walk from Marble Arch to Trafalgar Square, if you were just walking it without dancing or whatever, it takes a good, at least a half an hour just to walk normally. But the Rathiatra procession lasts for about two and a half hours. During the Rathiyatra, when we turned from Piccadilly to go down Haymarket towards uh, Trafalgar Square, then the, uh, the Rathiyatra cart began to go out of control and the braking system was not working properly, so it was starting to accelerate down the hill. And the devotees were sort of blissfully unaware of what was going on. But the police could see that this was happening and the police started to get into anxiety. So I remember one policeman approached one of the devotees in a, in a mood of great concern, asking, who's in charge here? Who's in control? And the devotee turned around and said, Krishna's in control, and went back to the kirtan. When we arrived at Trafalgar Square, at one point, Srila Prabhupada looked around, he saw a small street, and he started to go down it. This wasn't on the procession route. The whole procession starts to follow him. He was looking for a place to pass urine. <laughs> and Lord Juggernaut and the whole procession was going right along with him. This was another one of these events, you know, very special events like the opening of the temple of Vrindavan. This was conquering London, you know, he conquered the British, Prabhupada. And we knew what he was when, when he was young, when he first met his spiritual master, right? He was into the Gandhi movement, you know, he, was, he wasn't into British rule. So now he came and took over Britain. That's what he did, you know, it was like right back in their face. These are special triumphs I think that Prabhupada really, really enjoyed. This festival, <clears throat> we made a lot of promises to the, to the authorities regarding, you know, how we would conduct ourselves, things we would and wouldn't do. We set up these tents. This is the one right with those yellow tents. In order to secure these tents, with, with the lines you can see that come from them, we just drilled holes into the cement and drove iron stakes, you know, pegs in there, <laughs> which was with a total no-no for the authorities. But anyway, the, the festival went off. It was just really sensational with so many people. Prabhupada was very pleased, there was no doubt about it. But the following year, they just absolutely would not give us any leeway for performing a festival. 
it took some time for them to regain their trust in us. There he is in Trafalgar Square, the center of the British Empire. Thousands and thousands of people. This was Prabhupada's triumphant moment. Looking out at thousands of people chanting Hare Krishna in Trafalgar Square. And I came down to Trafalgar Square and uh, to see the arrangements there. Everything was fantastic. We hired these beautiful palm trees. It was like India, you know. It was a beautiful day. And, uh, but I was totally exhausted. And was, by that time, I, was, I couldn't focus on what was going on. It just happened. Whatever happened, happened. And it did happen. <laughs> I was very pleased. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it says that Rathiyatrakat seemed to be higher than Mount Meru. And then Prabhupada writes in the purple, there was a gorgeous Rathiyatra festival in London in 1973. The Guardian newspaper reported that the Rathiyatra car seemed to be higher than Nelson's column. And he put that in the purport of Chaitanya Chaitanya <laughs> But then it's in the uh, conversations books that they, Shamasuna said to Prabhupada that one devotee, Mahavishnu, he, he received some money from his aunt. Actually, it wasn't my aunt, it was my uncle, which paid for the Rathiatra festival. And Prabhupada said, he has spent his aunt's money well. <laughs> and that was good. Oh. I just, the, the overwhelming memory of, of that festival is the dance. The, 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 the dancing that, um, just defied logic because you just kept going and going and going and just wanted more and more and more and just wanted it to last forever. I just felt like I had received so much mercy that day from Siva Prabhupada. And then after, you know, after he spoke, he wanted to go back. And so we went to Berry Place, Shamsundra Drove. I also went. He was, he was so happy. He was very happy with the Rathiatra. He, he was very pleased that day. And he started talking about transcendental competition between the gopis. He said, not, not like this mundane competition. Oh, you are doing better than me? Let me smash you. No, you are serving so nicely. Let me try to imitate. He says, in this way, ever increasing ever-increasing transcendental bliss. <laughs> I had uh, volunteered to stay back to look after Radha Landanishwara, and I was feeling a bit, you know, like I was, I was missing out on seeing Prabhupada. And, but he came back earlier than the devotees, and I, I think he was with Shamsunda, and they came in the temple room door, and there was Prabhupada, and, and the servant went downstairs to get something for him. He went to take darshan of the deities, and so I got to take Prabhupada's slippers off. And I remember having his lotus feet on my hands and feeling conscious how rough my hands seemed for his beautiful soft feet. But it, it was really lovely to touch Prabhupada's feet. And, and it was a really special moment because there was no one there and somehow Krishna had created that little moment in time when I got to be with Prabhupada.
Yeah. <laughs> 